Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. E.J. Dion is one of our nation's most engaging and influential political journalists. He grew up in Fall River, Massachusetts, graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University, earned a doctorate at Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Today, he's a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, and a professor of government at Georgetown University. He's heard weekly on national public radio and appears regularly on MSNBC and other network news shows. He's the award-winning author of six books, including Our Divided Political Heart and Why Americans Hate Politics. His latest book and the topic of tonight's presentation, Why the Right Went Wrong, offers a history of Republican politics from Barry Goldwater through the Reagan Revolution to the present crisis of unrest and discontent. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Eugene Joseph E.J. Dion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I should come here every Sunday. That was such a warm, wonderful welcome. Thank you. I, um, I want to say a couple of things. Um, I always like to begin talks with two stories. One, whenever I get a generous introduction like that, I am reminded of the one I once got. I was somewhere in the Midwest uh, where the person ended, and now for the latest dope from Washington, here's E.J. Dion. So thank you, Reverend. Uh, for that, and I also like to recall um, uh, a, um, an email I once got. You know, you may think that we, um, you know, political commentators, pundits are pretty arrogant. Indeed, we seem to work at it sometimes, but our readers keep us humble, and if you've ever read the comments under people's columns, you know how humble uh, they keep us. Uh, many things I get uh, in the mail that I could not repeat in this august uh, Church, but uh, I once got one, this is true, that began, Dear Mr. Dion, which was already way ahead of many of the others I get, Dear Mr. Uh, Dion, are you as dumb in person? Um, and I love to begin talks that way because you may get nothing out of this talk, but at least you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. So I... Um, I want to say what an honor it is to be in this great church. I was talking to a friend here in Minnesota earlier today uh, who said it's a great old building with an extraordinary public purpose. Uh, and this church has welcomed Republicans, Democrats, the non-aligned, the non-political, anyone who cares about building community uh, and advancing the common good. And it is just such an honor uh, to be able to be here. I'm also honored by Min Post uh, and Joel and Lori Kramer. Um, what they have done here in Minnesota has actually been a model at a time when um, lots of uh, substantive journalism, uh, really about self-government, about government, but in particular about our task at self-government, has been under financial pressure. They started a model here that's been reproduced around the country. And so not only should Minnesota be grateful to you, but we are all uh, grateful to you. And of course, I love public... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's give Min Post a... Um, the, um, uh, lastly, uh, Minnesota Public Radio. It, it is long before I had the privilege of arguing politics every Friday with my friend uh, David Brooks. Uh, I was an NPR fan, and I realized how much we listened when our son, our first child, was just learning to talk, and he kind of waddled up to me, and he said a word. And I said, say that again, James. And he said it again. And I said, say it one more time. The word was Chechnya. Uh, 
And he had absolutely no idea what he said, but, and I yelled across the house to my wife, we really do listen to NPR too much. Uh, in our house, I used to get him to stop crying by running, taking him around the house and singing the name Boutros Boutros Golly to him. It, it worked every uh, single time. Um, I just want to begin, I, I have written a book called Why the Right Went Wrong, and that means that I have been collecting Donald Trump jokes. Uh, and um, there are two in particular, and I hope God will not strike me dead in this church for the first one. Uh, because, as you may remember, uh, Trump picked a fight or, uh, with uh, Pope Francis, or he had a fight with Francis. Francis said some critical things about him. Uh, and my colleague, Carlos Lozada, on the Washington Post, was wondering, where will Trump go next? He's picked a fight with the Pope. Uh, and it is appropriate for the season we're in. Um, uh, so Carlos tweeted, it took him three days to rise. I could have done it in three hours. Uh, and then the tweet went on, Jesus, very weak, uh, said Carlos's hypothetical uh, Donald Trump. Um, and um, I, um, I also like uh, the joke, it was one of the t uh, guys on TV who told it that uh, uh, he spoke of a recent poll that showed that the election of Donald Trump would make 70% of Americans anxious and the remaining 30% Canadian. Uh, um, so yeah, we really are here, folks. Um, the, um, so I, I wrote a, I, I've been working on why the right went wrong uh, for some time, and I should say at the outset that I am, as most of you know, a liberal of kind of social democratic inclinations. I'd fit right in here with, in Minnesota. And I, I should say, by the way, uh, Minnesota lost a great man this week, Marty Sabo, that I think a lot of us are uh, thinking about. Um, the, um, the, and uh, so I fit right in here in Minnesota. And so the question is, why would a liberal write a book that's not only critical of the right, that would be to be expected, but uh, that's really trying to say that we need a better kind of conservatism. And I really do think that a functioning democracy uh, needs an intelligent form uh, of conservatism, that uh, we, we on the progressive side uh, have ideas that need criticism that sometimes don't work. I think conservatives have a point when they ask us to honor tradition. Sometimes a tradition needs to be overthrown, uh, but it shouldn't be done uh, lightly. Um, and I also think conservatism has a lot to contribute in reminding us that human nature is imperfect and that while government can create circumstances in which we can behave better, a gov government can't remold uh, human nature. One of my favorite lines, I may have used it from this podium before, is Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who once said that original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian church. Uh, and I, I think that within the conservative worldview, there are reminders of this sort. Um, but what has happened to the American conservative movement, I think, is not only bad for them and the crisis they're in right now, you can see, but it's very bad uh, for the country. The kind, I, I was reminded of this today, when I was over at the University of Minnesota and I spoke at the Humphrey School, and here you had the Humphrey School in front of me, and on the right side was the Carlson School of Management, I think it's called. Uh, and it was a reminder that back in the day there were uh, possibilities of the Carlsons of the world and the Humphreys of the world uh, to cooperate uh, in trying to solve problems. Uh, and we have lost that for many reasons, but I remind in my book that one of the central reasons uh, is the steady movement of conservatism uh, ever farther uh, to the right. Uh, and I think that's why they have gotten to where they are today. The first sentence of my book is, the history of contemporary American conservatism uh, is a story of disappointment and betrayal. Uh, and I argue that ever since Barry Goldwater ran for president in 1964 uh, and, the, and his movement basically took control of the Republican Party, conservative politicians have had to make a series of promises to their supporters that they couldn't possibly keep. 
Uh, they promised, for example, to reduce the size of government. Uh, none of the Republican presidents since Goldwater, not Nixon, not Reagan, neither President Bush, uh, has been able to keep that promise. Indeed, when Ronald Reagan left office, uh, government was almost exactly the same size as the share of the economy as it was uh, when he uh, took office. The deficit was a little higher, uh, however. Um, and why is that? Well, there are two great analysts of uh, public opinion who wrote many years ago uh, that Americans are ideological conservatives but operational liberals, um, which by which they meant that Americans in principle have real questions about government and obviously we are always on the lookout for oppressive government, uh, but in practice we want quite a lot from government. Uh, we expect quite a lot from government. Um, and my favorite example of this is the Tea Party itself where many, many members of the Tea Party uh, will say we want to reduce the size of government, but please don't cut Social Security or Medicare. Uh, now their argument is, well, that was an earned benefit and the other stuff is for freeloaders, but it is not accidental, I think, that the Tea Party is a rather old movement. I dare say a majority of its members are near, at, or over the age of 65. Um, but it isn't just Medicare or Medicaid that people want. We want our schools, we want our roads uh, and bridges and our transit systems. We want government to protect uh, the air we breathe and the water we drink. And so it really is actually quite difficult to uh, reduce uh, the size of government. And so conservatives haven't been able to keep that promise. Um, they promise uh, to roll back a series of cultural changes, in a sense uh, repeal the liberal part of the 1960s. Um, well, most Americans don't really want to do that either. There continues to be resistance to civil rights, and we're seeing it in a particularly virulent form at times on the campaign trail uh, this year. But the fact is, we don't want to go back to before the days of the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act. We don't want to go back uh, to uh, a, a view that rejects the equality of men and women. Indeed, every conservative dad I have ever met who happens to have daughters uh, is a feminist when it comes to the interests of uh, his daughters. Um, and then there's a third promise, which is more recent, uh, which is essentially um, to restore the ethnic makeup of the country to where it was around 1950. Uh, essentially, <laughs> Uh, to not only repeal the Immigration Act of 1965, but reverse all the effects that have happened. Um, you know, and that is part of why Trump promises to deport 11 million uh, people who crossed into our country illegally. Um, well, that's not a keepable promise either, as most people know. Um, this cycle of promises made that could not be kept um, has created a more and more radical uh, conservative movement. And my book uh, is largely historical. By the way, I urge you to buy it, if only because I have five more years of college tuition uh, to pay. So if you buy the book, think of yourselves as making a contribution to the education of my dear daughters. They are, they are very much worth it. Um, the, um, but the, um, the Republicans, um, have radicalized because their basic constituency says, we keep voting for you uh, and this doesn't happen. As I was saying, the book is historical and I go through uh, with the effects of the Goldwater campaign, um, the Nixon presidency, all book writers would uh, should say a prayer for Richard Nixon uh, every day. What a fascinating, uh, it was really fascinating to go through Nixon's presidency because in some ways, Nixon was one of the most liberal presidents uh, we have ever had when you look at what the democratic bills he signed, creating EPA, creating OSHA, indexing Social Security, wage price controls, really an extraordinary list. Yet he was also the president who ushered in uh, the um, Southern strategy and the sort of conservatization of the Republican Party and a law and order strategy that got him uh, George Wallace's vote. Um, I talk a lot about uh, the Ronald Reagan and the ambiguities of Reagan. I, I talk about Reagan as the ambiguous hero uh, for the right because there was Reagan the movement conservative uh, and uh, who really was an ideologue and then there was the Reagan who governed with a democratic congress uh, and made quite a lot of compromises. If you look at some of the things Reagan did on taxes, on immigration and on a whole lot of other things, liberals are always inclined to say he would lose a primary. Uh, in the Republican Party today, and yet uh, the right of the party is not wrong when they look at other things Reagan once said about uh, his 
um, you know, his deep underlying uh, ideology. And I'd be happy to deal with it in the q and I have a complicated view of both uh, Bush presidencies. But the point is that they, the, the conservatives have been disappointed and, and they've radicalized, and that's part of the reason why both Donald Trump and Ted Cruz are at the head of the field. There's, there's a second reason, which is, uh, and this really comes uh, from some of the, of what your former governor, Tim Pawlenty, used to uh, talk about. The Republican Party has relied, uh, partly since Nixon, certainly since Reagan, on the votes of white working class voters in election after election, uh, and has delivered them no material benefits. Uh, Governor Pawlenty used to talk about the Republicans as the party of Sam's Club. Uh, and two conservative writers, uh, Ross Douthat, whom some of you know from the New York Times, and Raihan Salam, wrote a, a, first an article and then a book about this idea that we Republicans, they said, can't keep expecting to get these votes uh, if we don't do anything for these, uh, these voters. And I think Donald Trump is the revenge of the Republican uh, working class. Now, it's very odd to have a billionaire, or at least somebody who tells us uh, he's a billionaire, um, he tells us a lot of things. Um, it, the, it's very odd to have a billionaire leading a class war, but that is, in effect, uh, what he is doing uh, inside the Republican Party. And he is the author of one of the more remarkable lines uh, in American politics. He said, uh, I love the poorly educated. Uh, and, and it is a line that we all laugh at, especially a politician saying that. And yet it is worth all of us thinking about the fact that our poorly educated brothers and sisters, the people with less formal education, have really been hammered in this uh, economy of ours. They are really hurting. Uh, and for many of them, a vote for Trump is a cry of protest. For some of them, a vote for Bernie Sanders uh, is a cry uh, of protest. Now, that's not all that's going on in the Trump movement, and there is, I think, a significant element of racial uh, reaction there. I think one of the things, in a curious way, we might end up being grateful for uh, is that Trump has really surfaced how much racial feeling there has been uh, within parts of the conservative movement. You used to talk about dog whistle politics, now it's bullhorn uh, politics. There's nothing subtle about what uh, Trump is saying on some of these questions. And I think, um, you know, it, the big danger is that this becomes a license uh, for prejudice in the country. Uh, the positive uh, side would be if this really pulls people back, including many conservatives, some of whom I honor for speaking up against this kind of uh, of rhetoric. Um, and so that is where we are now. And the Barry Goldwater campaign is very important. I think we will look back uh, and see it as one of the most important events of the 20th century uh, because of how much political change uh, it brought about. It, it really led the Republican Party uh, to become almost exclusively uh, a conservative a party. Um, here in Minnesota, uh, you know as well as people like me from Massachusetts how many uh, progressive uh, Republicans there used to be. There were even people who called themselves liberal uh, Republicans. I always like to... Yeah, there. <laughs> That's Senator Durenberger, whom I think is here tonight. God bless you, Senator. Um, the, um, uh, the, I, I, I like to tell people that uh, I was the most boring thing you could be as a teenager. I was a teenage liberal Republican. Can you think of anything more boring uh, than that? At least my parents didn't mind. It kept me out of trouble. But um, the, um, I decided fairly quickly it didn't really work very well. But there used to be uh, liberal Republicans. There were moderate Republicans. The liberal Republicans were defeated over a long period of time in primaries, starting 1968 with Senator Tom Kuchel uh, in California, defeated in the same primary on the night that Robert Kennedy uh, was shot. Jacob Javits in New York, defeated by Al D'Amato. Uh, Clifford Case in New Jersey, whom National Review Magazine used to refer to as Hopeless Case, uh, defeated in a primary uh, in New Jersey. Um, and then you had a lot of them who in the House who went down uh, in primaries. And then the moderates started losing uh, in general elections because many of the moderate and liberal Republicans represented Democratic districts. Democrats were happy to vote for a progressive Republican, but over time, uh, they didn't want to empower uh, congressional leadership, for example, uh, uh, led by the House led by Newt Gingrich. And so my own 
congressional district in uh, suburban Maryland, a great moderate progressive Republican called Connie Morella with a little bit of artful gerrymandering, but mostly because the Democrats who really loved her, the day they voted her out of office, just didn't want to empower the right. But that was only one part of the story. Um, the other part of the story um, is that many moderates looking at their party, looking at the southernization of the party, people in the Northeast and Midwest, um, said this isn't our party anymore, uh, and they left. Uh, they left in very large numbers beginning in the 1980s uh, and continuing on uh, into uh, the 1990s and right through today. Just to give you a, a figure on the southernization of the party, um, in 1960 and 1978, uh, I'm sorry, in 1960 and 2008, um, the Republican contingents in the House were of a roughly equal size. There were 174 Republicans in 1960, 178 in 2008. But in 1960, 35 of those Republicans represented districts in New York and New England, just New York and New England, 35, and only eight hailed from the states of the old Confederacy. In the 2008 Republican House, only three came from New England and New York and 73 uh, hailed uh, from the old Confederacy. This is a party that totally uh, changed its regional base, and Northern voters acted and West Coast voters responded uh, accordingly. And so when Republican leaders ra looked around this year, uh, except in Minnesota and a couple of other places, uh, and said, well, how do we stop Trump or how do we stop Ted Cruz? Most of the voters they were looking for weren't there uh, anymore. They had left uh, the um, Republican Party. Um, so I think that the party has hit a crisis point. I think what's happening this year might accelerate uh, change uh, in the party. Um, and I just want to close by making a couple of points. One is there is a, a hero in my story, uh, and that hero is Dwight Eisenhower. Um, and I talk about Eisenhower, I, I, with apologies to every Adlai Stevenson supporter uh, uh, in this room. Um, and there may be, there may be a few uh, in this room. Um, the reason I talk about Eisenhower is when you go back to the Goldwater time, um, the choice in the Republican Party really was Goldwater or a different form of conservatism. Now, we moved so far right that people don't even view Ike as a conservative anymore, but as all the Stevensonians in the room would know, he really was uh, a conservative. He was very much uh, fiscally cautious uh, president. America, he was prudent in foreign policy, but America was stronger when he left office. He was very much in favor of public religion. It's in that period, you'll uh, recall, that uh, God got on the currency and into the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. It was part of the rise of a kind of uh, public religion. Um, but there were two things about him. One is um, he was a conservative and not a reactionary. And I think we really need to rediscover that distinction between uh, conservatives and reactionaries. He understood that if your concern was to preserve a way of life, uh, which I think is the real goal of conservatism, sometimes you have to change and reform. Um, I like the Edmund Burke line that the duty of a statesman uh, is to have a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve. Uh, it seems to me that pairing is what conservatism uh, is really about. Um, so Ike, both for political reasons, because he said over and over again, if we propose repealing the New Deal, we'll never get elected, he told Republicans, but also because he thought those programs responded to real needs in the country, so he didn't overturn them. And like two great forerunners of the Republican Party, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his hero Henry Clay, he understood that the federal government had a role in helping build the country. And in Ike's case, uh, he built it literally with the interstate highway system, the largest public works program in history. Uh, and he built it intellectually in the, in the, in the job market uh, with the National uh, Defense Education Act, the student loans that sent millions of Americans to college, including, I should say, me. Um, and this was a kind of a conservatism of prudence and balance. And if you've never read it, I suggest you go home and take a look at Ike's farewell uh, address a couple of days uh, before John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Uh, and he uses the word balance over uh, and over again. And I think that is what uh, conservatism needs today. There's something else it needs today. 
Um, I, I have been struck, as many of you have, if you watched uh, the Republican uh, debates. I have to do it for my job. Some of you might have uh, done it for um, enlightenment or entertainment. You can, uh, uh, you can take that where you will. Um, the, there is an incredible gloom on the right about the nature of the United States uh, right now. Um, you know, the, the hats that say, make America great again. Uh, I don't think of myself as a jingoist, but I think the United States is pretty great right now. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, if you look at how we survived the downturn compared to virtually every other one of the rich uh, democracies, we are better off uh, the most. It doesn't mean we don't have serious problems to solve, particularly the problems of those left behind, uh, but we have uh, recovered more quickly. There is a gloom about the uh, change in the ethnic makeup of the country, um, but why is this any different than uh, the 1910s or 1920s? Why are the new arrivals from uh, Asia and here in, in the Minneapolis area, Somalia, uh, and Mexico and the Dominican Republic and all across Latin America, why are these new arrivals fundamentally different from Italians and Jews and Poles and all the other people who came to our country uh, back uh, in those years? Um, thank you, yeah. The, uh, um, and, um, and I think that the, these immigrants are a sign of the life of our country. People want to come to America and want to help build uh, our country. Um, and I accept uh, arguments about immigration, about the speed in which people should come in, and well, let's have a real argument about the economic effects. But the fact is, in the long run, we have been better off uh, welcoming uh, people to our shores. Um, which means, I think, that the conservatives need a heavy dose, and here I want to uh, invoke Sarah Palin. Uh, I think <laughs> conservatives need a heavy dose of the hopey, changey thing. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I really did always like that one. Um, you know, they rightly revere what came before us, but they will not prosper if they continue to yearn for a past that they will never uh, be able to call back to life. Uh, they will not succeed if they celebrate only the America that, what was, that once was uh, and not the vibrant nation that is busy being born. And I would just close uh, with a quote from my friend Ike. Uh, Eisenhower said, neither a wise man nor a brave man lies down on the tracks of history to wait for the train of the future to run over him. <laughs> I want my conservative friends to get off the tracks and face the future with hope and with confidence. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you take a seat just for a second? What? Come on, take a seat, and then we'll go to the questions. I've got to do a little public service oh, okay. here. Thank you, E.J. Dion. We're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our guest tonight is Washington Post columnist and political commentator E.J. Dion. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our generous funders and partners, including our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, which is heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and the media sponsor for our spring series, MinPost, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, reader-supported source of Minnesota news. Visit them online at minpost.com. Please join us for our next forum on Thursday, April 14th at noon, when Jacob Hacker will explore the topic, The Forgotten Roots of American Prosperity, Aligning Government and Business. Look for information on the full spring season at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Mr. Dion, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First question has to do with uh, politics and religion. You mentioned uh, 
Ike's uh, introduction of, of religion more openly into the public sphere. Uh, Vice President Mondale will be in a dialogue sermon with me here in this very pulpit oh, in two exciting. weeks. And this will be a topic that we'll be talking about. I'm going to fly back. I yeah, want to see that. It, <laughs> April 3rd at 10.30. We'll see you there. But it's interesting if you track the role of religion in American politics over the same period that you've, that you've analyzed in your book. Uh, can you say a word about that? About religion. Religion and politics? Yeah. Um, in that same time period particularly. Um, yes, I, I think that one of the things we need to be aware of is that there are cycles of religion's engagement in our public life, uh, that well, we are always a religious people and that religion uh, has had a lot to do with our politics from the beginning. And those on the progressive side, uh, and it would be obvious in a church like this, um, should remember that religious people were at the heart of the abolition movement, that religious people were at the heart of the civil rights movement, they were at the heart of all sorts of movements for social change in the progressive era. Um, Jews and Jews, Jewish and Catholic immigrants were at the heart of union and social justice movements. So religion is always there and not just on the right. We've had this odd idea that religion lives only on the right. My, favorite joke about this, which I can't resist, uh, Miss O'Reilly being taken the polls by her son. She has always voted Democratic. Her son is now quite well off. He's an independent, but votes for a lot of Republicans. Asks the mom how she's going to vote. She says, straight Democratic. And the mother says, oh, hush. Why? I, 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 he says, um, you know, if Jesus came back and ran as a Republican, you would vote against him. And she says, oh, hush. Why should he change his party after all these years? <laughs> um, and and we have a lot of commotion about this issue because people think he has changed his party uh, after all these years. Um, you know, and, and think about this shift from the 20s to the 30s in terms of a change in this. In the 20s, religion and uh, social issues, in that case prohibition, saturated our politics. The big issue in 1928 was whether Al Smith should be the first Catholic president. Uh, jump to 1932, a funny thing happened on the way to 32, which was the Great Depression. Um, and suddenly those issues didn't quite look the same. A, um, a party boss in Missouri wrote Jim Farley, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's campaign manager, he was saying the prohibition can't be the central issue. If you remember, it was wets versus dries, pro and anti-prohibition. Uh, and he said, I don't know why wet Democrats are arguing with dry Democrats when neither of them can afford the price of a drink. Uh, and then we went through a long period of, even though our presidents were very publicly religious, and listen to Roosevelt. Roosevelt invoked God arguably more than President George W. Bush uh, did. Uh, but, and he was also a war president, and war presidents tend to invoke God quite a bit. Um, but nonetheless, religious issues didn't loom large, and we were totally surprised when they came back uh, in a big way in the late 70s and early 80s with the rise uh, of the uh, religious right. Um, I think this election is transforming uh, the religious landscape in two ways. In fact, I think uh, the odd pairing of Pope Francis and Donald Trump are altering the American religious landscape. In Pope Francis's case, and I say this as a Catholic and a great fan of Pope Francis's, um, he is scrambling uh, the politics inside the Catholic Church by restoring an older emphasis on social justice as a central part of Catholic teaching uh, and by pushing against a culture wars uh, approach to the Catholic Church's uh, public mission. And I think he's having a larger effect uh, as a result of that. He's also kind of internationalizing uh, the social justice message. Um, on the Trump side, um, he is clearly showing that the, the evangelical movement has been split in this election. Evangelical voters have been um, between Trump and Cruz. Uh, and there are a lot of evangelical activists who, and preachers who are pre speaking out against uh, a vote for Trump. Um, but I think one way to look at it is that this is sort of raising the, the question of whether um, parts of the religious rights engagement were primarily about a religion and the social issues, the moral issues they cared about, uh, gay marriage, abortion, uh, religious liberty, and how much of it was actually a form of tribal uh, politics and a form of self-expression. And I think for a lot of the evangelicals who are voting for Trump, there is this strong sense that the culture is becoming de-Christianized. Note how often he says, when I'm president, you'll be able to say Merry Christmas uh, to everybody. That's a regular part of his speech. 
Um, and so I think we are going through a kind of transitional period uh, again in the religion and politics uh, sphere. Um, this is a subject I love, so I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. Good. It's the pulpit that sort of draws me out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Tell me about it. Right. <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting a lot of questions, a lot of questions, not surprisingly, about Donald Trump. Can you do a little prognostication? You've done a lot of you know, historical work tonight, but look ahead in about a year. Two scenarios. One, we have a President Trump. What happens to the Republican Party? The other, we don't have a President Trump. What happens within the Republican Party? Uh, I don't know where I'll be in the first uh, instance. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I was, um, I was thinking that after the extraordinary record of Washington pundits over the last six months, you're going to ask me to predict uh, the future. Um, uh, I truly believe Donald Trump cannot get elected president of the United States. Uh, I, uh, um, uh, for the record, my wife, who has a shrewd political mind, thinks I might be wrong. But I, uh, I don't believe he'll be elected president, uh, partly because women are going to save us from Donald Trump. Uh, uh, the, The, as I didn't mean to pander, but it's fun when it happens. Uh, the, um, now, we'll look at the recent Washington Post ABC poll. Trump, uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton led Donald Trump by nine points. Trump beat her by five points among men. Hillary Clinton beat Trump by 21 points among women. Um, and I think partly it's that women historically have always been more resistant to extremist candidates uh, than men. Uh, and without going into any detail, there may be other aspects of Mr. Trump that turn uh, women uh, voters uh, off. Um, and so I actually don't think it's going to happen. I think the Democrats are fearful that Trump could make some of the Midwestern states, heavy industry states, uh, uh, competitive Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, just half Midwestern. Um, and um, that's possible, but I think the loss will be much greater on the other side. Uh, if he wins, God knows what happens, and he's not telling us tonight, I guess. Um, the, um, I think you could have uh, extraordinary problems with Congress. We don't really know what Donald Trump believes. One of the reasons so many conservatives don't want him is they still think he's a closet liberal from back in his days of contributing to Hillary Clinton and others. Uh, the, um, uh, and I, I just think it would be an incredibly difficult moment for the country and the Republican Party uh, if that happened. But again, I just don't think we can predict, uh, you know, we don't fully know who Donald Trump is except the person he kind of shows us. Uh, and I have to say that when I see him, I am reminded of that great Hollywood line that what you need is sincerity and if you can fake that, you can do anything, you know? <laughs> um, if he doesn't win, uh, now, that, I, I think the, the let's, let, if I could alter the question in good politician fashion um, and answer the question I want to answer, um, <laughs> it's, uh, but I'll the answer yours too. Um, you know, what, I think the Republican Party is in a real fix because if they, if Trump gets close to 1,237 delegates and they don't nominate him, he does not seem to me a guy who, like a guy who would quietly lose graciously, right? <laughs> uh, and I think there would be a real potential of a drop off of a lot of, of Republican votes. I don't know where they go. I don't know if it would be third party, but they face a problem on that side. But if they do nominate Trump, uh, they face, uh, um, you know, they face the losses that I described, particularly in better off areas and suburban areas and particularly among women. Um, what my hope is, is if that does happen, the kind of rethinking and revolution on the right that I am talking about, not to channel Bernie on behalf of the conservatives, but I do think they need a kind of revolution. In my book, I talk about some conservatives who are trying to begin the process of rethinking you know, there's some people who call themselves uh, the reform conservatives, or as I like to call them, reformicons. Um, I don't think their thinking currently goes far enough or is revisionist enough. I think there's still too much within the confines of, of where orthodoxy is in the Republican Party right now. But I think after such an experience, um, there might be more room for 
uh, broader rethinking. And the other reason I think that happens is because younger conservatives, and there aren't that many, I mean, if you try to look up exit polls, uh, online and we're looking to see what the under 30 Republicans did. The data often wasn't available because there weren't enough under 30s in the sample. Uh, but there are younger conservatives and Republicans and most of them really do want the party to start rethinking. So that's my optimistic um, you know, read that it, of what could come out of this. Could you say something about the international uh, implications of, of our uh, political life right now in the presidential election? Uh, the standing of the U.S. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Trump's comments and the implications with what happened in Brussels this morning and some of our security experts responding to uh, the kind of agitation overseas that, that uh, the more extreme view here in a political campaign is, is provoking. Well, you know, what, what Trump really strikes me as, uh, and uh, this should bother some people on the right, it's kind of the Europeanization of American politics because uh, if you think about who Trump resembles ideologically, uh, it's really the European right and far right. Uh, people like Marine Le Pen uh, in France and some of the right-wing parties in Scandinavia, uh, this uh, new right-wing party, um, Alternatives for Germany in Germany. Um, you know, this combination of um, sort of very harsh anti-Muslim, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, you know, sometimes tinged with racism, uh, and sometimes more so given what he said about Mexicans. Um, uh, you know, so there's that side of it. But then there's also economic nationalism, his opposition to trade, uh, a certain amount of e genuine economic populism when he does say, I'm not going to cut Social Security, I'm going to negotiate Medicaid drug care drug prices. So this politics is a European right, far right, that we're not accustomed to. Um, you know, does this kind of uh, uh, campaign uh, improve our image in the world? No. Um, and I, I wrote a column about, uh, with the very restrained uh, headline, uh, the GOP Vulgarians, uh, after that uh, awful debate where we were debating the vital uh, national question of the size of various parts of Donald Trump. Uh, and it was really appalling. And, and, and you know, in fact, a lot of conservatives uh, were really appalled by that. I mean, they're the folks who have talked about demeaning the culture. And that night, uh, you know, if somebody had told me that that was an American debate, I would have said, no, uh, that's anti-American propaganda. We wouldn't do that. So I think some of this is very bad uh, for us abroad. On the other hand, two things. One, I am a believer in a robust democracy and free speech. These feelings are out there. Uh, in the end, it's better that we debate them and surface them. I want some of these ideas defeated. Um, and number two, I am very much with that great Churchill line that probably most of you know, that Americans always do the right thing after first exhausting all of the other possibilities. Um, <laughs> It just seems to be taking us a little bit longer uh, this time. Uh, you're a journalist. Uh, to what extent is Trump a creation of America's media? Um, I um, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm you're serious. Welcome. Actually, I think there has to be an accounting uh, after uh, this election. I'll tell you a story. I was in our kitchen, have a little TV in the kitchen, uh, and. Um, it was on MSNBC uh, during the 2012 campaign. My, our, our older daughter came in one night, and she's a liberal, but she said, you know, MSNBC is always on that TV. I feel like we're one of those Fox families. So <laughs> we, all, we all have to look at ourselves. Uh, this is a confessional up here. Um, um, but I had MSNBC on, and they had a Trump speech live. And so I said, I don't want to watch that, so I switched to CNN. And they had the same Trump speech live. And I called across to my wife in the kitchen, and I said, what is this, Trump state television? Um, this is very distressing, and that, that there are studies that show uh, that Trump, not only, he didn't just start getting all this attention when he started rising in the polls, it predated his rise uh, in the polls. And Trump is excellent uh, at figuring out the weaknesses of individuals and institutions. He is really shrewd at it. You've seen it in the primaries. Uh, and there's a real crisis right now in television viewership and particularly a real fight going on on cable. Um, and uh, he is box office. He is ratings. People who 
hate him like to watch him, and people who like him like to watch him, and people who are some, uh, entertained by this performance art uh, like to watch him. Um, and I think it's really troubling, and I think at the end of this campaign, I hope there is a sort of some examination of conscience. The new um, media writer who replaced the, well, no one will ever replace David Carr, the great media writer for the New York Times, but who has that, yeah, his, He's a Minnesotan. Um, he's from St. Paul, as I remember. Uh, and it was a wonderful guy. Um, but the new media writer is very good. And he had a column about this problem, uh, his, I think his first column uh, on Monday, Jim Rutenberg, and it was very good. And I, so uh, I think the spirit of the question is critical, and I agree with the critical spirit of the question. We, gotta, uh, we print people haven't been quite so bad. Uh, partly because we have a lot of space, but we are not above writing about, you know, realizing that Trump is page views, and, uh, you know, hashtag Trump is good for tweets, and I know that, and I use hashtag Trump uh, myself. So we all, uh, we all can sin, but I, I think this television coverage is particularly is something we've got to really think about. Not give him, don't not cover him, but the degree of coverage uh, has been troublesome. The imbalance. Mr. Dion, you've thoroughly described the self-destruction of the GOP. Is there a comparable uprising afoot on the Democratic <laughs> Party among voters, progressives and liberals who feel that they haven't gotten what they're voting for? Um, the, we can have a whole evening on self-destruction. Uh, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, a couple of things on that. I, I do think, I, in the book, I talk very much about what I think. I don't let uh, my own side off the hook on this. And I talk about, I have a, I have a very complicated view of the Clinton period, which I <coughs> talk about at length, that I think that some of the corrections and direction that uh, Bill Clinton uh, inaugurated were necessary for the party, but certain things didn't have to happen the way they happened. For example, I thought it was quite legitimate to say um, that crime was a real problem in the country, because it was, and it did make you a racist to worry about crime. We had been going through a serious crime wave uh, in the country. It was real. It was people didn't make it up in their own heads. Uh, that didn't, in my view, mean you have to support the death penalty, but it, it did, certainly didn't mean that we had to pass those elements of the crime bill, some of which are actually progressive, but we didn't have to pass those elements that produced the vast over-incarceration, uh, that encouraged the vast over-incarceration. A lot of the lo other laws were at the state level. Um, and Clinton himself has said he made a mistake. Similarly, on welfare reform, I always wanted to align welfare and work to encourage work, uh, but I ended up at the time opposing the welfare reform the president signed because I didn't, I always thought you needed to match work with social generosity and I didn't think that it was uh, the kind of social generosity we needed. Um, and clearly they went too far, oh thank you, uh, and they clearly went too far in financial deregulation. Again, I think that Clinton is quietly, um, um, and so, um, so that, I thought that was implicit in the question, but um, I think that uh, the impact of the uh, economic downturn of the Great Recession um, and the irresponsibility that was, uh, the, uh, in irresponsibility of Wall Street um, has really fundamentally changed politics. And I know, I assume from the applause, there were some Bernie feeling the burn folks uh, in this uh, audience. Uh, um, but I think if you also look at how much Clinton has, where Clinton is on this issue, she is not running as a 1990s Clinton Democrat and hasn't been uh, for quite a while. So I think there's been uh, some adjustment here. Um, but above all, uh, I think the party does need to respond, A, to the, the, the white working class that's hurting, B, to the inner city folks, African Americans, not only on the issue of uh, um, unarmed uh, young African Americans being killed by the police, but also to the fact that the 90s were a period of exceptional gains by African Americans, but those gains were very fragile and no one got hammered harder uh, and sort of lost more ground than African Americans. And I think feeding the Black Lives Matter movement is not only a desire to reform, um, uh, uh, reform incarceration laws reform the police, but also this sense of economic uh, 
uh, this sense of um, economic deprivation and, and sort of backward movement. Uh, what we need is a politician who can bring together these groups who do not vote together ever. Uh, that's why many of us kind of revered, I'm saying this in G. McCarthy's state, I love G. McCarthy, but I also love Bobby Kennedy. And I think many of us revered Bobby Kennedy because we thought he might be the guy to do that. Well, we never got to find out if that would have worked in the end. Um, and that's the Democratic Party's job. They can't give up on the white working class and they surely shouldn't give up on their commitment to racial justice and they gotta figure it out. And uh, President Obama's made some real progress. I am not, uh, in the book I am, critical of President Obama for having too much faith in his own ability to convert Republicans. I think he figured that out uh, eventually. Um, you know, the conservatives elected him editor of the Harvard Law Review, and he always thought he had a way of dealing with conservatives, and I think he does. He has a real respect for conservatives, but I'm not critical of the overall Obama project, where I think we underestimate some of the, the progress that has been made uh, in that period. Uh, that's a long... Um, that's a long answer. I'd be happy if I'll sign the book to you or even not and take it up with you afterward. But I do talk about what progressives need to do in the book. Final question for you. Are you hopeful about America today? Um, I am describe myself sometimes as a glass one-tenth full person and <laughs> a friend uh, once described me as a felicopath. Uh, so I am, by nature, uh, hopeful. I actually remind everyone in this church that hope is a theological virtue, uh, uh, faith, hope, and charity. Um, and so I love the hopey, changey thing, as I said earlier. Um, I actually, uh, so a straight up answer to the question is yes. Uh, yes, for the Churchillian reason, that I do think this country has had an extraordinary capacity for self-correction over a long period of time. One of my favorite Obama speeches uh, is the speech he gave in Selma, which if you've never had a chance to look at it, I really commend to you. Um, because, um, you know, there are a couple of ways of celebrating American history. Uh, and one way uh, focuses on the founders and basically sort of sees them as having the right answers from the beginning. And if only we keep going back to the founders, uh, and try to keep that going exactly as they had it will be okay. Now, I happen to love the founders, but I think that's a misunderstanding of the founders who are actually a bunch of revolutionaries uh, who inaugurated an extraordinary experiment uh, in self-government that hadn't been seen before. And the other way to look at American history um, is as this long process of reform, agitation, correction, uh, and forward movement. Um, and sometimes it's not a straight line of forward movement. We sometimes have setbacks. Not everything we call progress is progress. Uh, but we come a long way uh, as a country. We're a slave country that abolished slavery. We were a country of segregation that abolished uh, segregation. We were uh, a country that had a very high degree of economic inequality in the 20s. We made that much better in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and now we're back to where uh, we were in the 1920s. There's no reason why we can't uh, do that uh, again. So. Uh, and that I think we have a lot of raw material here. We're a, an entrepreneurial country, we're a talented country. Talented people want to come here. Hardworking people want to come here. So I am very hopeful about us. But the only thing that can hold us back is our politics. Uh, and uh, our politics is not working very well. And I guess I'll close with this. And again, being inspired by the pulpit I'm at, I want to close with St. Paul. Um, that. Um, one of the reasons I wrote this book is I really want to live in a world where conservatives and liberals don't fear the victory of the other side. They may not want the victory of the other side, but we shouldn't fear. Um, I always told my kids that, my, uh, that their mom and I didn't vote for George H.W. Bush, but we actually thought he was a pretty good president, and he accomplished uh, some real things, uh, th really some good things uh, for our country. I also want to live in a country where we can talk to each other again. And one of the fun things about... Um, one of the fun things about doing this book is I've been in Washington so long that I predate the hate. So I have, uh, I had a lot of conservative friends whom I could sort of talk to, people like Vin Weber. I have some Vin Weber stories in the book. Uh, but also some of the new conservatives uh, and some of the Tea Partiers talked to me. 
Um, and it was uh, very enlightening. And I think we need that capacity again. And so St. Paul, uh, who said uh, that we must see through each other's eyes uh, and think through each other's minds. Uh, we don't do a lot of that today. Sometimes, again, I'm a sinner. Sometimes I very much fail uh, at doing that. But I think democracy really depends on our capacity to try uh, to do that. Uh, I tried to do that in this book. Uh, and Minnesota nice is a real thing because Minnesotans do better at that than most of us in the rest of the country. So thank, thank you, E.J. Dion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.